It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Woohoo! Welcome to the big show. This week, we are going to do a deep dive into music publishing with my good friend, Mr. Michael Ames. <laughs> they love you. And I know I'll forget to mention this as often as I would like to. So I'm going to plug the book right now. Michael and another really good friend of mine named Bobby Borg, who you guys have seen at the Road Rally and on Taxi TV, um, have just recently co uh, co-authored and released this book, Introduction to Music Publishing for Musicians. I've got to say, I spent the better part of Saturday, probably four or five hours on Saturday, uh, going through this book to find stuff to ask on today's show. Michael, first of all, welcome to the show. And second of all, your friggin' book is awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I mean, I got to give props to Bobby. I mean, I know Bobby has appeared many times on a taxi TV and has had a whole series of, of great books that he's put out. So it was it was awesome for me when he asked like hey do you want to join me like i think we should do like you know uh let's he's always covered publishing a little bit in the in the books that he's done before and and i always sort of helped him try to answer things and then but so when he came to me you know just as the pandemic was starting it was like hey what else are we going to do during a pandemic let's write a book <laughs> so that's that's what we did and it was a lot of work, but it was it was great for me to learn from Bobby, the book master. Uh, and it was quite an experience. But uh, appreciate you taking all the time and having me on today. This is this is awesome. I always love Taxi TV. Well, thanks. Uh, and I want to let our viewers know we have a little bit like a probably a three second delay between us audio wise. So it's a little clunky, but the picture's good. Uh, yeah, I, I spent a big chunk of Saturday here at the office uh, reading the book and highlighting stuff. And uh, it's unbelievably comprehensive. I mean, there are books that are out there about publishing that are very technical and kind of, you know, not that warm and friendly to read. They're hard for the average person to get through. Um, this book makes a lot of sense. It's written so that a musician can understand it and actually says that on the cover. It says, Introduction, introduction to Music <laughs> Publishing for Musicians. There we go, musicians right there. Um, and the range of topics, it's not just all technical stuff about publishing. It's a lot of the practical stuff about it, how the business operates, even like how to talk to a publisher, you know, some um, etiquette stuff. It, really, really, really good. So I am giving it two thumbs up, my personal endorsement. I never endorse anything that I wouldn't put my name on. So great job on the book and happy to have you here. Um, I want to read Michael's well, thank bio. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You are so welcome. Uh, I want to read Michael's bio so that uh, people who haven't seen him on Taxi TV or the Road Rally before have a, a good idea of how well credentialed he is and why he was certainly well qualified to co-write this book with Bobby Borg. Michael Ames is a trained composer, songwriter, and pianist with experience in film scoring. He studied music at Cornell University and UCLA Extension. He also secured a minor in business management from Cornell. As president of Penn Music Publishing, Michael oversees all aspects of the operation as well as focuses on pitching the catalog to all media and business development. Uh, prior to starting Penn, Michael oversaw the international activities in film and television department of Don Williams uh, Music Group, where he was responsible for song catalogs and brace yourself for this, such as Jimi Hendrix, Chicago, and Roy Orbison, among numerous others. Uh, he also worked previously for Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys in the management and music supervision firms, the Derek Power Company, and Seth Kaplan Entertainment. Michael's past president of the Association of Independent Music Publishers, um, proudly serves on the Independent Publishers Advisory Council and the National Music Publishers Association. He's also a member of the California Copyright Conference. What a bunch of brainiacs they are, and I mean that for real. Uh, and the National Academy, <laughs> Reco <laughs> National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences, NARIS. Michael wrote the music publishing section of the Hal Leonard published book entitled Five Star Music Makeover, the Independent Artist Guide for Singers, Songwriters, Bands, Producers, and Self-Publishers. He co-wrote that with Bobby Borg 
co-teaches with Bobby at UCLA. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, I messed up my editing on this. Anyway, um, and he co-authored this book right here once again. <laughs> All good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, last but not least, Michael's a frequent guest speaker in classrooms and panel discussions worldwide, including the Taxi Road Rally and Taxi TV. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, Mr. Michael Ames. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, somebody, Gloria Covington, says in the chat, what doesn't he know? And I'm not much, frankly. I mean, I've known Michael for, I don't know, 15-ish years or more. Um, it's not like we're besties and we go out to dinner with our wives and such, although I know his wife. Um, I think you may know mine as well. Maybe we should go out to dinner with our wives. But I am I so... I was going to say, well, we, st we still need the chicken wing thing, but that's a separate oh. discussion for another time. That's right. I totally forgot. Um, Michael's really smart and incredibly well informed on the subject of publishing. Uh, and honestly, I was talking to him before the show, and I think I included in an email that went out to you guys, which is I know a lot of music attorneys. And if I ask them a question about something a little more obscure in the publishing realm, I, I won't get a good answer from them, um, whereas Michael knows about it upside down and inside out. So he's usually my first call I make when there's something that's confusing, which is a lot of stuff. Uh, anyway, okay, I want to start with my favorite subject. <laughs> well, you know, there's a reason I've got the gray hair here, so <laughs> that, that, that comes from both age and stress. There you go. Well, I'm right, right there with you. Look at that on the sides, man. I'm getting there. <laughs> um, you know, my son-in-law's stepdad is a handsome guy, a really nice, gregarious, handsome guy with, like, pure silver hair. I was at a, a kid's birthday party a couple of years ago, and there were a couple of legitimate actresses from L.A. at this birthday party, and the, uh, the stepdad, who's got to be, like, in his mid-70s, walks by, and one of them says to the other one, they didn't know I was hearing, she goes, that's the definition of a silver fox right there. <laughs> 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 anyway, I digress. Okay, so I want to start with my favorite question to ask Michael, um, because this is something that rears its ugly head almost on a daily basis here uh, at Taxi. Certainly gets to my email box a lot. And that is when people check that little box on CD Baby or TuneCore or wherever that says, would you like us to monetize your music? And people go, oh, hell yeah, I'd love you to monetize my music. And they don't realize when they check that box that they've either signed an exclusive publishing deal or a non-exclusive publishing deal. And that is going to get in the way of pitching that material that they checked the box on maybe three years ago and they don't even remember or they didn't realize what they're doing. But it's going to screw them up when they try to submit that same music to a production music library or a sync agent. Well, sync agency doesn't take publishing on. But anyway, can you address that issue, Michael? Yeah, happily. I mean, you know, it, it's, I know this is a, a question you always like to ask. It's a question I am always happy to answer just because I think, you know, frankly, the whole reason we wrote the book is for everyone to be aware of, you know, what your rights are in the business, how it all works, how how everything sort of operates and you know there and, and you know to be fair i'm totally friends with the cd baby guys and and the tune core guys and i do feel that they you know they 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 occupy an important space because there is a you know i mean it, it, we're different topic for another time but you know one of the biggest topics in in music publishing and the industry overall i'd say in the last couple of years has been the explosion of independent artists in diy you know yep. it's it's they're getting to be to have a larger market share of everything that's going on but but again i i think what everyone needs to sort of realize is that yeah when you have you know their when you have those check boxes on the CD Baby, you know, sign up for CD Baby Pro, sign up for TuneCore Publishing Administration, 
the the folks who are generally being the ones that have to be the one to click the box aren't necessarily realizing the full implications sometimes i'd say uh and i think even cd baby and TuneCore, uh and it's not just them but i though i think they're the two main you know ones that get into this situation much much like ascap and bmi aren't, aren't the only pros but they're the two biggest ones right um you know, I think everyone needs to realize, as you and I are going to do a deeper dive on today, there's lots of different kinds of income uh, types and income streams that exist in publishing. And you do to do your job right as someone who, like, uh, if you'll even let me back up real quick, what I think sure. is important to understand that we get into in the book is that, you know, anybody when they write a song, as soon as they write it and it, you know, it gets embodied into physical form, you've got a copyright and you're the publisher of it. You are always the publisher of it until you sign a piece of paper uh, granting rights to somebody else. So, you know, getting to your point of the question, you know, when they're checking these boxes, what what they what you are doing is you are transferring usually the exclusive administrative control of your songs and of your your underlying publishing that you own over to the company that you just checked that box for so like cd baby pro is powered by song trust uh they do all the back end you know administration work and you know, and TuneCore does it themselves. Um, I mean, in house, I should say. But you know, what I run have run into multiple times that is it is a very frustrating thing in the publishing world is that a lot of independent artists, when they are writing songs and releasing it, they maybe haven't set up the infrastructure that they should. Like you haven't necessarily set up a, a publishing company at your performing rights society which is a really good, I mean, it's really imperative that you do that. But then what happens is that when you don't have one set up, CD Baby and TuneCore, when they end up registering your songs, end up registering them, listing their own company as the publisher. And, you know, th that is partly, I mean, the nature of the relationship is in the contract you've signed, which is an administration deal. You're not transferring ownership over to them so i want to make sure everybody is is clear that that none of that is going on but you have to register a song and you need to be registering it with a publishing company so if you don't have one set up those companies are going to register it in their name but we've taken over a number of catalogs from both of the companies when they've registered things in their in their company's name and it just adds an extra layer of complication and confusion because you need to obtain a document from them that says they're giving all of the rights back to the writer you know as of a certain date and then then you can take over after that but i want to not avoid the other part of your question which is usually those deals are exclusive um, I, I have heard of situations where you would be able to exclude sync from that so that you could do something else with your sync, but I don't believe that it is in a very obvious choice that you right. have um, when you're doing the sign up. And you, but you're absolutely right in that you know when you sign any exclusive deal with anybody, that means you can't grant those rights to somebody else. So, you, you know, I know when you sign up for all these sites and we're all we've signed up for so many sites at this point and, you know, they all have their own terms and services. Right. You know that we all have to check a box and you have no choice but to agree to them. But when you're doing that in this particular case, I don't think everybody is actually reading those terms, uh, you know, <laughs> terms of service, I guess. TOS is what it is. Yeah. So, you know to really know what you've what you've actually gotten yourself into and it's usually a minimum term of one year and then usually cycles for uh you know monthly after that so you've you've really got to be fully aware of what you're doing before you agree to anything because the implications just can domino i completely concur and i i too am friends with people at cd baby i don't know anybody at TuneCore right now but you know they're not evil companies they're not trying to screw anybody but i do wish right. that they had a pop-up that before when you check that box 
and you click OK, that it gives you a pop-up with kind of a fail-safe that says, do you understand that you're signing an exclusive publishing administration deal? Therefore, you cannot submit this elsewhere for another publishing deal. They should at least do that because people, look, we all do it. I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. Uh, you're downloading software from, from the internet and you just click, yeah, okay, okay, okay. I just want to try the software, damn it. <laughs> okay, okay. Hey, I got it. Now, what I, what I think they... Where, where I I do commend CD Baby and TuneCore for for sort of highlighting this is what, and I believe TuneCore came first uh, as far as offering the publishing administration, and then I think CD Baby was second. Um, doesn't really matter, but you know the idea is is for all the different ways in which you and I will go through some of it today, you know these distributors were realizing that all of these independent artists were leaving money on the table. And, you know, there is specific music publishing related money that's totally separate from the master recording that get generated in foreign territories. And if you don't have the infrastructure and the knowledge to know that that income exists, you know, you're, the money's going to sit there and you're not going to see it. So I, I applaud them for, for pointing out to everyone, hey, do you realize that, you know, you have money over there? where I have at times been at odds with how it's presented is anyone has any one of a number of options to get that money collected. You can go to lots of different publishers. You can go to lots of different places. You don't have to only get that money collected, you know, by checking that box as you're uploading your, you know, your recordings to be distributed. It's not your only option. Um, so again, it all comes down to, I think, being informed and what are you agreeing to? What's in your best interest with what you have going on in your career? And like anybody, you need to know your business. It's called the music business for a reason. The second term <laughs> has a lot of information attached to it that you should be aware of. And people are asking, well, should I not work with, you know, CD Baby or TuneCore, one of those other companies? You can absolutely work with them. They're great at distribution. They're great at a lot of things they do. Just it's a separate checkbox for the music monetization, the publishing aspect of them monetizing your music. So just make sure that you don't check that checkbox if you don't want them to administer your publishing. It's that, that simple. Yep, I uh, totally agree. All right, so let's move on to some other stuff. Um, you were talking about rights that people have, um, and, and I, the book has a lot of 101 stuff in it. It also has a lot of kind of mid-level stuff and higher-level stuff, but one of the 101 things is it talks about the bundle of rights that are inherent in, in your music. Can you explain what a the bundle of rights is? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, the when we we did the book, we're focusing on the U.S. copyright law. So, you know, bear in mind with everybody that every country of the world, you know, has their own set of of copyright laws. And there are lots of other ways in which, you know, countries have banded together in in different treaties, I guess, for lack of a better word, where everyone is kind of operating the same way. But, you know, we focus mainly on the U.S. Copyright Act um, that you know it's had different permutations though the one we focus on the most which was the pretty uh, substantial change which was the 1976 copyright act that became effective january 1 1978 um you know but one of the things that that i learned in doing this with bobby and what bobby is a master at kind of what you were saying just now about sort of 101 stuff is kind of taking complex things and putting it down in not only sort of a language, but presenting it in a way that everyone can get their head around. Um, and sometimes that involves um, coming up with almost mnemonic, you know, devices of what <laughs> things to, to remember, right? So one of the things that Bobby had, I think, either had in one of his previous books or had certainly developed through all of his years of teaching is that we talk about in the book, you know, the this concept, uh, I think it's even chapter one of CDPDs is sort of how, you know, we've always referred to it, which is meant to embody the four main rights that you get under the Copyright Act. And, 
you know, so it's the first C is copy. You get the right to make a copy. That can be a copy of, you know, like we're used to a physical copy of a CD or, you know, now as I'm sure we'll talk about, we're getting into making copies when we come with interactive streaming now with Spotify. We've got, you know, sheet music, you know, you're making copies. So anytime you're making a copy, it's a right you control, it generates some income. You know, the, the D, the first D is you have the right of distribution to sort of put out your music, uh, you know, present it to the public, distribute it to the public. You know, there's, you've heard of lending rights or rental rights to the public, um, but you have the right to control the distribution of your copyright. Then the, the P of CDPD is perform. Right. So there are exclusive rights around the performance. So and it's and it's a public right of performance. So anytime your music is publicly performed in any different number of media or venues, you have the right to control that you should get paid for it. And lastly, the, the second D of CDPD is derivative. You get to a derivative is when someone takes, you know, an existing work and creates a new work out of the original work or a piece or section of that original work. So you as the original copyright holder get to to decide if you're going to permit a derivative work to be created from your original. So those are the four main sort of rights that everybody should be aware of. And, and Bobby, I think cleverly came up with the CDPD way of trying to just sort of, you know, just remember it in your head and and then we talk as as i'm sure you and i'll get into we kind of talk about the four main food groups of music publishing that kind of emanate out of those rights which are the different kinds of of money that one can earn well go you might as well talk about the four food groups right now because my stomach is growling anyway so you're just gonna oh, make okay. me hunger <laughs> <laughs> yeah fair enough yeah so you know the so the four main food groups as we like to call it uh, since we're all used to that sort of nomenclature is the first one is mechanicals so you know when when a, a work and some of uh, of your listeners may have been heard of oh I've heard about this mechanical royalty what is a mechanical well you know a going back to that C of CDPD with copy you know the term mechanical royalty came about from you know when something had to be mechanically reproduced, a copy was made, and when that copy included a copyrighted work or a song, a royalty was owed for that copy. And of course, back in the, the original days of music publishing, that was like, you know, the, the piano rolls that were <laughs> manufactured and put in the player pianos, but we, of course, are all used to more of the, you know, CDs, vinyl, all of these sort of products are mechanically reproduced. A machine is creating them and making the copy. So every time a copy is made, a royalty is owed. And so that, so, and then the mechanicals, we'll, we'll get into, you know, I'm sure a bit deeper in a second. I don't want to stay off the four. We'll cover the four main ones for now, but there's also a, the interactive streaming part of mechanicals. But let's just, for now, yeah. cover mechanicals is that you know anything that relates to a copy right and then as we as the the p in cdp cdpd uh refers to we got performing royalties so whether that's tv radio you know live venues internet you name it there's a performance royalty when your music is performed publicly you're owed money um that's why we joined performing rights agencies uh, the third main for uh, third main food group is synchronization. So you get to be in control of when your music is synchronized with a visual image. That is a whole separate, you know, sort of right. So therefore, when anyone wants to use a piece of music in a video, they need permission. They need permission not only of the the underlying song or the publishing, but then they also need permission for the master recording. Sometimes the owners of those are one and the same. Sometimes they're different. But either way, permission is needed. A fee is paid. Terms are covered, you know, in a license. And, and then the great thing with sync, frankly, is that it, it also can tie into those first two main food groups. Because, of course, every time something gets synced, 
and then gets put in a say a theater outside the United States or on television because theaters in the United States don't generate public performance royalties but we do obviously on television you know a, a sync will result in performing monies and then if you if your song got used in a sync related thing but also got put on a soundtrack album well then you'd be making mechanicals because the album would be selling too so sync to me is is sort of you know the the trifecta if you were if you will of you can cover multiple food groups with with one use and then the fourth and final food group is print um, which is sheet music. Um, what's becoming more and more popular these days is monetizing lyrics. So you've got, you know, lyrics that are either getting shown, uh, you know, on websites or be, being reproduced on t-shirts or what have you. Um, you know, and sheet music now is a very small uh, part of the income one can make in publishing. But, you know, Ballads in particular sell extremely well with sheet music because a hit ballad, everyone wants to learn to play them on the piano or on guitar. So you're going to go to your local music store and maybe buy that 4 or $5 piece of sheet music. You're going to go to sites like musicnotes.com and you're going to download the digital version and then you're going to print it out and learn it. Um, so it is, it's an important part of all of this. It's just compared to sync, mechanical and performance. It's a much smaller percentage, but those are the four main food groups. And there's lots of different, uh, Alice in Wonderland holes. We could go down not only domestically, but internationally, but generally those are going to be the four groups worldwide. And now everybody knows why I invited Michael to be my guest today and why this book is so darn good. Um, it's funny. Well, never mind. I, I need to move on. Um, work made for hire. What is it and what are the exceptions? You talk about it in the book. You know, we hear the phrase work for hire in the context of um, you hire a saxophone player to come in and do a solo on your instrumental that you're going to then sign uh, over to a, a production music library. That's a work for hire. Um, what's the difference between that and a work made for hire? And what are those exceptions? Gotcha. Well, well, work for hire and work made for hire, they're all referring to the same thing, right? So, so the, um, there, I would say most of everyone who's going to be tuning in is going to, is going to know, hear that term probably in two, one of two different contexts. The first is that anyone who might ever get hired to, uh, write music for a TV show, whether that be a composer and you're doing the underscore, or maybe you get hired to write a theme song, um, you know, or a song for a movie. You, the the agreement you're going to enter into will always have this this work work made for hire language, and what that is in the copyright law is that it it establishes that there is a relationship of basically there's an employer and an employee, someone who needs something and has money, hires somebody, pays them a fee to create something for their project. And in exchange for paying you to create it, they are going to become the owner of what you created. And you have to, you know, literally work, work made for hire doesn't exist until you have a signature. It's not something that's covered verbally. You're, you're literally transferring rights over to your employer or the, the one who commissioned you. Um, and the thing that I think, you know, it, in some circles, the term has kind of a negative connotation to it. Um, but it, really the reason it exists is for one very practical reason in copyright law, which is that you know, and we get into this a little bit in the book, but it, needless to say, it's a really complicated topic, and that is the subject of termination. So, like, if you you had done a publishing deal with somebody, you know, under our current 1978 copyright law, no matter what your agreement said, you have the ability 35 years after you entered into that deal to terminate it, and you get the rights to all your songs back. 
Now, mind that, mind you, that only involves the United States because that's our law. It doesn't apply for outside the United States. But you know, the the company you entered into that publishing deal with knows that 35 years from now, should you choose to terminate it, you can legally. Well, in the work for hire context, which is most common in like film or television shows, they don't they those are studios they have all these you know people who put come together to compile these great works you know of hopefully successful commercial art tv show film they don't want to be in a position that someone can terminate a license that that gave them the rights to use the music they they want to control it forever a work made for hire cannot be terminated ever so that is why these studios are always going to have that language in there because they don't want to give you the ability to terminate it. But where, where it, the context it also comes into is that, you know, we are all uh, you I know through taxi are, be, are are telling everyone to do this. We're telling it that when you hire musicians to perform on your demo, you know, you're paying them to do a demo. Well, you want them to sign a work for hire agreement, which basically says, you know, I'm giving you 300 bucks or whatever your negotiated fee is to do the demo. And they are assigning all of those rights over to you because that now allows you to go to the films and the television shows and all of that to say, hey, I control 100% of all these rights. I can enter into the license with you. <coughs> And, and it's important for any musicians that play on your demo that you have them sign something like this because it becomes an important part of what you need. And now I need water. Hold on. Okay. While you're drinking that water, I want to po pose a question. <laughs> um, my name yeah. is Johnny Jones, and I send my music to Taxi or by a direct connection. <laughs> I send a, an instrumental track to a production music library. They reach out to me and they say, wow, Johnny Jones, we love that cocktail jazz solo piano thing you sent in. Um, we could use nine or 10 or 11 more of those because we'd like to put out an album full or a collection of cocktail jazz. More often than not these days, they don't pay any money up front for that. Sometimes they do. Um, and maybe the more established you are and the longer you've been around, your credentials are good, and maybe you've got a little juice in the relationship, you can get paid up front. But there are plenty of libraries that will take 10 of your cocktail jazz things, put them in there. They directed you. They asked you to create that thing. You in kind turned it into them, but no money has changed hands. Basically, you're just doing licensing you're, you're assigning the rights, the publisher share and the master rights to that library. Is there a work for hire in there or not? Because money didn't change hands in many cases. Well, I mean, like so many things in life, there can always be that language if you allow it to be in there and you sign it. So am I going to say that that happens a lot? I. I don't honestly know most of the ones as you were referring to most of the you know legitimate established libraries they want to do it the right way so yeah. say they be like you know we're we want to do it as a work for hire so we'll we want an album of 10 songs we'll pay you a grand a song ten thousand dollars total you know but then everything is a work for hire they the publishing is not something you're going to own uh, the master is not something you're going to own and it, oh, the library will and then you know depends on what your deal is with the library as to what the back end of that will look like for you um, but in most of the cases I've run into where what you've just described where there isn't money changing hands they're probably I'm guessing going to say hey we really like this um, we're you know you, you can still own it. You, we're we're going to retitle it and we're going to, you know, register those retitles like we're the 100 percent publisher. You can be, you know, the songwriter, uh, and, but we're going to list ourselves as the 100 percent, you know, publisher. And, it, you know, that that whole retitling is a tricky area and one that I think is going to be a bit more prob problematic as time goes on and technology 
develops, uh, we can we can dive into that a bit if you feel we ha- end up having some time. But you know, I would certainly just say before you're signing anything with a library, if you are not savvy about what it is you're signing, gotta have somebody read it for you. You know, sometimes the situations are such where it may not make sense to have an attorney you know sort of do it because they're going to charge you way more money than you might ever earn or in like your example there is no money changing hands so do you really want to go out of pocket you know sort of hiring an attorney to read something but you know i would definitely not be telling someone to sign something with work for hire language when no money is changing hands because no matter if they try to tell you that they're retitling or not just by virtue of the law, once you've signed a work for hire agreement over to somebody else, they own it. End of story. Um, I always tell people, you know, I'm not a music attorney, I can't give legal advice, but the library, music, li- instrumental tracks in a music library um, are not as, I, I don't want to say this the wrong way, they're not as valuable as a, a hit song you might write uh, potentially for Ariana Grande. Um, so I always tell people, look, if, if you don't want to spend $500 an hour for a music attorney on a contract that's for a 90 second instrumental cue that probably won't make you a lot of money in its lifetime. It's the aggregate of having a thousand cues out there that will make you money in your lifetime. My advice to people is go on the taxi forum, make friends with other people, and then ask them in a private message, by the way, have you ever signed anything with this library? Uh, have you ever heard any complaints about their contract? Have you heard good things about the way they conduct themselves in a business situation? Do your research. Look to make sure they've been around for a number of years, if not 10 or 20 years. Uh, look to see which shows they get music on. All those things will indicate this is a company I probably want to do business with. That won't supplant what an attorney does looking at the actual legalistic language in the contract, but at least you know you'll be doing good business so there's that um let's move no, on I, to honestly that's fantastic advice i i think everyone should just talk to each other and find out their experience and do your research do your research absolutely um yeah i i've i've actually heard recently of a taxi member that got the contract signed it immediately upon receipt and sent it right back to the library so clear, and it wasn't somebody who had done business with that library before. Yeah. Anyway, but again, if it's for a ninety-second, you know, cocktail jazz instrumental cue, um, nobody's ever going to court over that. You're not going to lose your house if somebody steals that. I, I don't mean to diminish the value of any music, but a ninety-second instrumental cue that you could bang out ten more over the next week probably not as valuable in the long term as writing your grand opus, the song that some major star is going to cut. Um, okay, let's talk Agreed. about joint works, collaborations. Um, somebody just had a great question a minute or two ago in the chat room, which is, I just co-wrote something with a collaborator. I'm from the U.S., my collaborator's from the U.K. Um, can you address collaborations in general where the you know percentages generally fall is kind of a default and then address the international collaboration because we have a lot of those at taxi no these are these this is these are great questions um well the you know the the joint work question and the way we address it in the book i just want to sort of reiterate we kind of done that from a u.s copyright perspective so you know when when two or more people collaborate on a song um you know it it becomes what it gets referred to in that legal world as a joint work meaning you can't really uh take bits and pieces of it out away it all becomes sort of merged together and the law presumes the u.s law presumes that the splits amongst the collaborators are equal unless there's something in writing stating otherwise. So again, two writers, it's gonna be 50-50, three writers, third, 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 that's what the law is going to presume. Um, But what I would uh, heartily recommend to everybody, regardless of of that, and so this includes both domestic 
you know, US based as well as international collaborators is when you're done with a song, please, please, please have everybody sign a split sheet. You know, have everyone write down what what is your your writer name? If you're a member of a society, you've been assigned what's called an IPI number, which is a unique identifier to you as a songwriter. You know, do you have a publishing company set up? You sh you ideally should. So, what's the name of that? Put it all down on paper. It doesn't need to be complex. Have everybody sign it. You know, because everybody feels like, oh, we're all friends. I don't want to ruin the creative vibe, you know, by having everyone sign. But, you know, there won't be much of a creative vibe when the song goes to get released. And all of a sudden someone has decided, you know what? I actually think I deserve more of that song than what you actually sort of gave to me. And they hold it up because it's not going to come out because they're insisting that they did more. And you can bypass all of that by having everybody, hey man, let, when we're done, let's always make sure we sign split sheets. And I, I especially want to encourage everyone on split sheets to not only address the writer and publisher splits on the song itself, but please address the master. Because so many songwriters who are not producers sort of assume that the master is going to be split the same way as in which the writing and the publishing is split on the song. And I think any producer will uh, understand and uh, support me here where they're just like, hey, no, guys, we're not splitting that equally. We wrote the song in three hours and then you guys left the room and I spent the next 20 hours slaving over the recording i fund my studio you guys haven't paid for any of my studio gear yada 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 you know i'm gonna own the master so i think everyone needs to have you know a conversation either before the session or certainly after the session of how you're going to approach your business and put it all down on paper so that no one can object afterwards it just makes life so much easier because i cannot tell you how many records come out where splits have not been figured out ahead of time. And it's worse in some genres than others, but I mean, it it, it only creates problems. Um, you know, but as far as the collaborating between someone sort of US, you know, and international, you know, the, the still from sort of, again, a US copyright perspective, even if a collaborator is, you know, not American per se, it's not like, they are completely immune from what the law states of how the US copyright law works. So, you know, I think honestly, the split sheet is the best way to handle that. Wherever, wherever anybody is from, you know, it ultimately comes down to putting down on paper what everyone's agreed and just take care of it, move on to either the next song or focus on promoting the song that you have. It's just really not worth you know, not taking care of that up front and having them having there be all these problems later. Yeah, it, it can get uncomfortable, and I understand that. It's kind of like you know presenting a prenup and a uh, consent consent to uh, have adult relations on the third date, if you will. It can be clumsy, but it's <laughs> got to get done. You know. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, and you I know mean, what? Look, I know uh, you know. Sorry, the only thing I was just going to say is just, you know, I, there are some writers that will want to address it before you even write. Yeah. And frankly, they're going to be the ones that have gone through this a lot and have experience, so they'd rather address it up front. But, you know, if, the, if you're in a situation where I totally understand you're getting to know somebody for the first time, but you know what, when you're done, I think everybody only looks good to handle that business themselves because... You know, yep. you're really then going to find out if they're going to be your friend. Are they going to respect the fact that you want to take care of your business and you guys document everything? It's ultimately for their protection as well. I think everybody, as long as you communicate well and get through to the other side, I think you probably then go away from that knowing I would co-write with this person again in a second because I love the way that they handled everything. Uh, and I think that it can be a very short document. Can it be like a sentence or two, literally, that says, um, the undersigned writers all agree that whatever work is created in today's writing session, please fill in the date. Um, and then maybe this working title of the song when you're done, if you have one, um, that we agree that it's equally split among the writer, all writers in the room. 
Uh, no, I totally agree. We have a sample uh, split sheet uh, graphic in the book. Um, but I mean, I, I, you know, the concept is simple. Everyone who's involved in a song, you know, <laughs> thank you, Michael. Um, I'm like a trained every, dog. You know, put it, put it down on paper. Put it down yeah. on paper. Um, and what I think is also important, just a quick postscript on that split sheet thing, is that, you know, many, and this is for the artists sort of in the room, is that, you know, w one thing that is valuable to know in, in, again, U.S. copyright law is that you, every writer on a song gets to decide what the first use of that song is going to be. Because there have been situations where, say, an artist has been in the room, they write a song, it's intended for that artist, but maybe one of the other writers is also an artist, and they decide that they want to record the song first and release it first, and that can cause you know drama amongst everybody. So it, the graphic that we have in the book also addresses like everyone sort of agreeing to what is the intended first use of this song. So you know if the if the artist is one of the writers, well. You know, I think it's in that artist's best interest to say, you know, to be released by, you know, whomever, whatever the artist's name is. But, you know, a tr documenting everything is never a bad practice and it will never bite you in the butt. I want to throw a bit of a curveball at you. And I really tried to orient. I looked through the book and, and picked topics um, from the table of contents and then tried to remember taxi specific incidents that are relevant to that topic. And one of them I had was on this topic, which is you and I are co-writers. Uh, we start working on something and we get it about 50, 60, 70 percent done. And then I decide I really don't enjoy working with you anymore. And we don't finish that particular song called, you know, Mary Had a Teddy Bear or something. And at some point, a week later, a month later, a year later, you look at that and go, you know, that's pretty good. I'm going to finish it up. Uh, and, and you do that. Uh, how does that affect a split when a project is walked away from either by one or both parties and one or one of the parties picks up the ball and carries it into the end zone later? Does that change the splits? Um, I, I'm going to answer this, I think, in, from two different perspectives because I think they're going to be both, uh, or I should say two different scenarios, not perspectives, to try to hopefully address when this would sort of come up. And that is, is that, you know, the, so yeah, you're, you and I wrote the song, we didn't finish it. Um, you brought in a third writer that helped you end up finishing it, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, when you want to release this thing, you know, you're going to want to come back to me and let's just say, that you know the that writer that you brought in didn't contribute say as much as either you and I did maybe yeah. you were miss we were missing a bridge and the third writer came in and locked in the bridge okay so maybe they should get 10 or 15% of the song but you know you you being the guy who brought the third one in you kind of you do need my permission technically to add that person to it or at least to figure out the splits the law again is going to presume an equal third but right. it's been yours and my best interest to us to agree in writing that that third writer you brought in, I of course can't argue that they didn't contribute because you're bringing me the song that includes that person's contributions that didn't exist when you and I did it. So it's clear that they're entitled to something. And, you know, from my own selfish point of view, if I only feel they contributed 10 or 15%, well, then I'm hopefully a reasonable person to say, yeah, no, that's great. They finished it. I love what you did. They give them 15%. You and I will split the remaining 85. That is still better for me and for you with getting 42.5% each instead of a third, 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 which is what the law would presume. So, you know, again, an instance where, especially because you're bringing in someone third down the line, absolutely, we need to be signing a split sheet amongst all of us because then that third writer can't create problems later by saying they really should get more when they shouldn't. Um, but I think it's also always good, though, when anybody is writing with somebody else, and I think the situation you're asking about is very common, which is you don't finish yeah. something. You, for whatever reason, you hit a wall, you're going to set it to the side. Well, 
I, I think it's incumbent upon everybody to always be organized and archive. You know, you're working on a song, however you work. Like, even if you don't finish it, be putting it somewhere, whether that's like in a literal physical filing cabinet or a digital filing cabinet, like keep a hold of that. Like don't, don't let it disappear or get lost because then when these situations come up, everyone has a reference point of how a song existed at a certain point in time before someone else contributed to it. So I just think that everyone should have a nice organizational system of how they keep their song ideas and who they work with. And, and you know, do, do your, we all write down calendars and schedules of who we meet with at a certain time. There's no harm in writing a similar thing about who you wrote a song with at a certain day at a certain time. Absolutely. Um, and if you guys but what I wanted to address, uh, sorry, go ahead. I would say, sorry, I'm, you know, knowing where we've got our slight delay, the only other thing I wanted to throw out there, which is coming, which is more in typical these days, we're in a very track driven uh, business at the moment, you know, dance music. And there's a lot of situations where, say, someone will come up with a track and frankly, they'll that has no melody, has no, or, uh, well, maybe it has right. a melody, but it's certainly a track, but there's certainly no lyric. And, you know, sometimes that track will get sent around to like, you know, tons of different people could be 10 or more or could just be a couple. And, you know, uh, basically people are fishing for top lines. You know, they're trying to find a top line that they feel fits for the track. And then maybe the DJ who put together the track kind of chooses which top line sort of they want. Those are the kind of situations where I think everybody needs to communicate very clearly before you even do a top line, because, you know, what you don't want to have happen is if you write to a top, if you write to a track and you really like your top line, but say that DJ doesn't choose yours, but you want to be able to take your top line and make another track under it. I think you need to, you know, even before you've written the top line, you want to sort of make sure like, hey, I just want to be cool here, that if in the end you guys don't dig what I'm doing, but I like what I did, that you, I'm going to be able to take it elsewhere and you guys that wrote the track aren't going to have a piece of my song. Like, address that up front so that everybody knows going into this because you can get into really dicey situations and, you know, you don't want to end up having the same track show up on multiple songs with different writers and it gets, <laughs> that just Embarrassing. only spells one thing, which is mess. Yes, for everybody but the lawyers. They love it. Um, if you're not familiar True. with it, um, one of our taxi members, who's a computer programmer by day, uh, came up with a program years ago now, like, I don't know, four, five, six years ago, called Composer Catalog, that is the most comprehensive organizational database for songwriters, you know, built for yeah. songwriters by a songwriter. It's amazing. So you should uh, check it out at ComposerCatalog.com. I'm only giving the plug because he deserves it. And you should know about it so you can include it in any updates of the book or any classes you're teaching. It, you, it tracks everything you've done, where it was sent, different versions of it, all that stuff. Who signed it, when they signed it. That's it, great. It's, Yep, everything you need in one handy dandy place built by a guy who actually needed it and was tired of using a spreadsheet. Yeah, I'm not aware of that. So I'll definitely check it out and we'll include it in the book because Bobby and I did. We have a resource section in the back with a bunch of different sort of links and, you know, places that, that we were familiar with for different aspects. And we would absolutely have included that one. So I'll make sure that we can include it in the in what we hope will be a second edition as, as long as there there is enough demand for the book to justify a second edition. I'm sure there will be because honestly, I am not kissing your butt by telling you how great that book is. I, the book is unbelievably comprehensive, super well laid out. And if I can understand it, anybody can. So there you go. Um, no. Oh, stop. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I'm going to avoid this next question because it's a 15-minute answer. Um, is there any chance you could come back tomorrow for the quarantine happy hour at 4 o'clock and do a 60-minute follow-up to this? Because you're giving out such great stuff. I would love to have you be my guest two days in a row. 
short notice. I um, <laughs> well, I would be honored. Uh, forgive me as I look down and I check my phone to tell me what is happening on a Tuesday. Uh, yeah, that works. No problem. All right. Everybody who's watching today's show, we're going to get, because I've got way more questions than we're going to get to, and I want to give you guys a chance to ask questions. Thank you, Michael. It's uh, You're an amazing guest. Seriously, I think I could do like a week of shows with you and never run out of really good information. Um, okay, moving on to the next well, one. The, um, I, anytime. I, I live this stuff, so happy to do it. Yeah, you do. It's obvious that you live it. Um, and Monica told me she actually has something else to do tomorrow at four o'clock. So if there's any way I could tie you up, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> That's my wife for those who, yeah, so, those who don't get the reference. Right. Exactly. It's not Monica from Friends or or Chandler or any of those people. Um, <laughs> okay. So somebody recently said, posed a great question and i remember uh, an actual incident where a friend of mine who's got 100 gold and platinum records on his wall did this very thing to me which was he sampled a snare drum sound from a record i worked on in like 1979 when he heard the record on vinyl he goes i love that snare and he immediately sampled it it's just one hit of a snare drum it's a sample um, technically, it's a copyrighted sample because the master recording is copyrighted and presumably the record label that put it out owns that master recording. Um, and I'm guessing that my friend has probably broken the law, but he would say, oh, come on, I've added reverb to that, I've pitched it up, I've pitched it down, I've affected that snare drum in so many ways. There's no way even you, Michael, who you know got that snare sound in 1979, could not recognize it on any record I've used it on because I've changed it so much. Has he broken the law or can you modify a sound enough that it's different enough from its original sound that it's no longer stealing a sample? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah that's so a toughie. <laughs> I'm gonna use your, um, I'm going to I'm going to use your disclaimer from earlier which is I'm not an attorney. <laughs> I'm not providing legal advice. Um y y but I think you know the well first of all I guess even though this is related but slightly different but I think it's worth pointing out because this the, the term sample gets kind of used in different contexts. Um, so technically speaking, in sort of our music world, a sample is when you're using an excerpt of an existing recording, and then that existing recording embodied a composition that was, you know, done on it originally. What can also happen is what is called an interpolation, which is you're, you take a section of a song that you know and you re-sing it or replay it you're not using an existing master recording <clears throat> you know a good example that i always use is we represent a share of the song i've had the time of my life that was made famous by dirty dancing and the black eyed peas about 10 years ago put out a record called the end and it had in it a song that they ended up calling the time in parentheses dirty bit and it used the chorus of Time of My Life. Did not use any element of the original master recording, but they lifted the chorus from the original song and basically made it their chorus. So that was an interpolation. So I just want to make sure that everyone tries to keep in mind, hey, when you use the term sample, make sure you're using it because you know you've used a recording uh, or a pre-existing recording. If you're just replaying something, it's not a sample. It's an interpolation. But to your question, yeah, technically your friend has broken the law because he took a took a copyrighted recording and used a section of it. And there is technically a composition that is embodied in that sample. And frankly, if I were the publisher of that song, I would certainly argue that I got infringed because it was my <laughs> song that was embodied in that. Um, but where where I needed the legal disclaimer is that, you know, in sampling cases, there's this legal term called de minimis that is basically like, you know, 
it, some some people who use samples will kind of make the same argument that your friend said to you. Oh, come on. It's like such a small, teeny might you know use no one's ever gonna know no one's gonna ever put it you know know the source and if they get caught you know their argument is gonna be oh i use such a teeny small bit of it you know they're gonna go into court defending their case as it's de minimis but you're gonna have to go through the process to convince a judge and potentially a jury if you get that far um that they agree with you and the amount of money that you will have spent legal wise getting <laughs> to that point to have someone maybe tell you that you're oh you're right we agree you use such a small amount you shouldn't be held liable for this um i would certainly say try to you know if if you really it, it, the reality is records are coming out every day with uncleared samples that i guarantee you just like your friend they're like i'm using this little horn lick or this little and it's probably more in the percussion end of things than anything else yeah. that you're going to feel like is not going to be discovered. But if you do it, just know technically you're taking a risk. You might get found, but perhaps more importantly of why it's a concern not to do it is that if you were to enter in an agreement with a record company for that record, you're going to have agreed to legal language in your agreement that you're going to have to quote warrant and represent that you right. did not use a sample. And if you did, you're going to be in breach of your own agreement and then you're really in trouble. So I'd say always try to do your own sample or, you know, if I were your friend, I would have been like, hey, Michael, do you remember how you captured that snare thing? Do you think you could do it for me again and come on over to my studio <laughs> and we can try and recreate it instead of like taking it off a recording? So sampling is tricky business and there's a whole subculture and sub business of music that exists just to clear samples and technology that exists to try to detect them. Yeah, I don't think that uh, you could detect the snare. He literally just took the, you know, the downbeat of the snare and not even the full reverb tail on it and then change it so much. There's no way, even with audio rec software, that anybody would identify it. But you know uh you're right um technically he's probably broken the law but it is de minimis because there's just no way to go oh that's the snare from the black eyed peas record there, there's nothing about it that could be traced back but i don't know if i steal a diamond and nobody catches me is it legal <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I guess you know I guess it's it's sort of like the flip side. I think if everyone imagines, would you want your song or recording used by someone else in that way without you knowing, you know, it, it, if you choose to use someone else's that way, well, you do so at your own risk, as long as yeah. you know what risk is involved. All right, moving on. Um, I'm trying to pick stuff that's not going to take 15 minutes to answer, but uh, here's a good one. <laughs> My, my, I can my, try to talk quickly, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you talk quickly enough. Um, my lawyer in Peoria says I should never give up any of my publishing. Um, yet a music library just asked me for 100% of the publisher share. What's up with that? Why should I give that library 100% uh, of the publisher share with me keeping 100% of the writer share, basically a 50-50 deal. But my lawyer in Peoria told me never, ever, ever, and they took a music law class when they were in college. Um, and they're a real estate lawyer now in Peoria. So, and, and no offense to Peoria, I grew up very close to Peoria. So <laughs> it's very hard for people to understand. Right. Yeah, who, who's right? It's like, yeah, great. If you're Paul McCartney, don't give up your publishing company. But none of us are Paul McCartney. And, and a library, I personally feel that libraries earn everything that they get because they have to do so much due diligence to make sure your song is kosher. They have to ingest it into their catalog. They have to do a lot of things behind the scenes you don't know about. You hand them a piece of music and sign a piece of paper. Um, should I give them half the publishing or is my uh, lawyer in Peoria right? Um, well, I would say, you know, this, this comes down to that, you know, hey, you should know, 
you should be familiar with how deals work and you should f be familiar with how the business works because you know you're if you listen to your peoria lawyer then nothing may ever end up happening with your music and you've made nothing right but like you were just saying if if the music library can go out and provide opportunities and uses of your music that you can't provide for yourself on your own well you need to make a bit business decision about like, well, okay, if their deal is that because they're a library, they're going to take 100% of my publishing and I'm going to take, I'm going to retain 100% of my writers. If they can do the job, you're at least making 50% of something instead of 100% of nothing. Um, that might have been the case if you had listened to your lawyer. So, you know, I think we all we all need to enter into every agreement with just, you know, taking a honest assessment of your own capabilities. You know, I'd say probably the the one songwriter that I can, you know, that I think is a very famous ongoing example of a songwriter who owns her own publishing is Diane Warren. You know, she she is amazing in that, you know, she is a rare example of you know, a songwriter that it, it, like we could rattle off all the songs, you know, even if the, some listening don't know who Diane is, they certainly know her songs and she owns 100 percent of her publishing and she employs people, you know, to look after it for her. But, she, you know, she owns it all. Um, but, you know, not everyone can pull off what Diane pulled off. So, you know, you usually need a partner to accomplish something in, you know, the music business, uh, you know, to quote sort of my my stepfather who passed away last year you know self-help is a myth you know for all of us in music it is it is a business of collaboration not only on the creative side but also on the business side so you know i think you should look at all of these opportunities in terms of all right you know going to this music library what can they do for me that i can't do for myself are they the best one that i should choose well you goes back to doing your research if they end up being someone who's legitimate does things a lot they genuinely like what you do well you know what give them a shot you know because especially the music library things like you talked about earlier with your other example they're usually going to be like tied to a specific song or maybe a set of songs if you did an album's you know sort of worth for them if it follow your gut if your research and your gut are aligned with positive responses chances are you're making a good decision so give them whatever opportunity you're giving them for the limited amount of your work see what happens if it works great maybe you continue that relationship if it doesn't work and they don't generate anything well then you move on to somebody else or maybe in the meantime you've met music supervisors and you can try to do it yourself you know, but of course, the more time you spend on business doing it yourself is probably less time you have to write. So everything is just all about striking a balance and, and yeah. trying to make a business decision. And we're not all going to make the right decision every time. I've made wrong decisions and learned from them, you know, and we've all done it, you know. But hopefully if you've done enough prep, you're going to come out with a pretty decent outcome for what will hopefully have been a good or great decision. It's a great answer. Um, I would expect nothing less. Okay, here's the next one. Um, do I, and we talked a little bit about mechanical royalties before. And I want to reiterate: mechanical means if something is going like this and, and pressing up, you know, discs or wax cylinders, or uh, could be a, a thumb drive with uh, your song on it digitally, and it's getting put on a keychain. Who knows? But do me, I get this question a lot. Do I get mechanical royalties if my music is used online? For instance, YouTube, online TV commercials, streaming services. And does a music library I've signed with ever collect those royalties? And do most share those with me even though they own the master? Awesome question. Um, okay. So... Uh, I guess I'll, I'll answer this in, I guess, what at least comes to my mind is a logical order. Okay. So um, the 
I guess I'm going to first take something like a Spotify or Apple Music, right? So mm -hmm. which is interactive music streaming. Meaning and, you, you, you know, pick what be, you want to hear. Well, it, yeah, correct. Because for like Sirius XM and Pandora, those are the two largest examples of what is referred to in the business as non-interactive streaming because it's like radio. You're not choosing what you're listening to. Someone else has predetermined that. There is no mechanical involved. There's only a performance. Okay. But when there's an interactive stream, so like Spotify, you choose it. Apple Music, you're choosing. You can set up your own playlist. Every stream is a combination of a performance and a mechanical, both. And the mechanical comes from the fact that it is either a sitting on a server or a multitude of servers at that streaming service because uh, it, it had to be copied onto that server just like you use the thumb drive example and then usually with spotify and all these others you know when you're playing the stream it's also being cached on whatever your device is right the data is mm. coming out over you know the the cell line or your internet wi-fi whatever and it's but it's it's being cached it's still being stored somewhere even if it's only a temporary cache cache is in c a c h e not c a s h um but that's where the mechanical part comes in and that it's a separate answer on where that money goes and how you collect it but let me get back to your so like your youtube example in my first example there's spotify and apple music which are audio only there's no video but as soon as we say we jump to YouTube where there's a video involved, well, then, you know, we kind of go back to that, you know, third main four of the four food groups, which is sync because you're putting music to a visual. And at that point, there kind of almost is no mechanical anymore. Whatever royalties you're going to earn come more from the sync because where we all earn money from YouTube. Uh, and this is putting aside uh, anyone who's an artist who has their own channel, who gets to that certain level that you have to reach before you can make money from your own channel. I'm putting that aside. But, you know, for, for those of us that, you know, um, help collect money off of YouTube, it, it comes down to the business did a deal. I'm going to call it a deal with the devil because I'm not a fan of Google um, or YouTube. But nonetheless, the business did a deal with them years ago where they knew that they were infringing copyrighted works like mad. And we all were trying to figure out a way, how do you, how, you can't put that horse back in the barn. So how do we monetize it? So Google came up with the, hey, why don't we run ads against it and we'll share the ad revenue with you. So, you know, that, that goes somewhat back to your, your checkbox that you talked about at the top of our time here, where do you want to monetize? Because that gets confusing to a lot of people when they distribute, because you want to, who's going to collect your monetization on YouTube, right? But but generally, the, the monetization on YouTube is happening because we're sharing in the ad revenue, and it's really as a replacement for what would have been a sync fee, but because we're not getting a sync fee, because it's just of the way that it, it's this, what's called UGC, user generated content, you know, no, for the most part, no one's getting permission ahead of time. So once it goes up there and then Google's starting to make money, they're like, hey, don't sue us, we'll split the ad money with you. And that's kind of how we got to where we are. So there really are no mechanicals on YouTube. It's ad revenue, but it's really akin more to a sync than a mechanical uh, because it's really a replacement for the sink. Yeah. Um, and to your point about who, so any music library is going to collect all those forms of income. Um, and music libraries, especially, frankly, make a lot of money on YouTube for, for you know, library cues of theirs that get used in a multitude of different ways on YouTube. But whether they share that money with you is really up to what you signed with that library. You know, some some libraries will only share certain amounts of in, certain types of income with you. Um, some might say, oh, we'll only be sharing uh, performance money with you. But that basically they're not sharing it with you. They're allowing you to collect it directly from your PRO whenever it shows up.
Right. So that's not sharing. Sharing money with with you is when they end up collecting it and then they give you half of it. Um, depends on the library. That's why it's important to know what deal you're signing ahead of time as to whether you're going to to get be entitled to that. But that those are the kinds of questions I think you need to go into a conversation with a music library to just say, so once I sign this deal with you, give me an example. What money am I ever going to see again from you guys? That money that goes directly to you. Because we're going to all assume that they're going to still get their performance money directly from their society. But, you know, if the library says, well, we're actually not going to share anything with you, we don't really share anything with anybody, then that goes back to what we just talked about of the business decision. Do you feel it's a calculated risk that you will you make enough money to have made the effort worthwhile? Or do you want to maybe not give your stuff to them and try to go to another library that might end up sharing that money with you? Some do, some don't. It does vary. Great answer. Um, I get this question a lot. And frankly, I don't know that you'll know the answer to this. You probably will. People say to me, how much money can I make if a piece of my music ends up being the theme song on a cable net, like uh, for a TV show that would be on MTV or something on Discovery? Um, you know, what? we run listings for those things every now and then. And I think people think that they're going to get rich from that, which, you know, they're going to make a nice taste on it. Whether or not they're going to get rich is debatable. But can you give a range? Because I honestly don't know. I, I would guess 20K might be, you know, a creative fee that you get on that, whatever the performance money is on the back end. Am I even in the ballpark? Um, well, I'd say you're probably a little you're high on the creative fee hmm. for a theme song. Um, mo most themes that that you know and and mind you you know it, this is this is a tough question to answer because the whole definition of tv is in right. a weird state right now right with all of our broadcast tv and netflix and amazon and hulu and all that i have probably seen most theme songs on uh, the upfront fee for that which would be a work made for hire like we talked about before right it's probably going to range between five grand up to maybe certainly 10 grand, maybe a little bit higher. Um, you know, but it's, I've, I haven't seen a $20,000 fee for a theme song in a long time. Yeah. Um, and it, then as far as the back end money goes, the, that's harder to answer because like you were kind of just alluding to, it depends on where is it airing? You know, CBS, ABC and NBC here in the U S are still the pinnacle of performing you know fees um you know but but those networks are you know dare i say eroding from their uh, you know power in years past so but but what what also can be tough is sort of like you know mtv and and frankly even netflix and all of those like no one's making a lot of money right now from back end off of any of those platforms yeah. we're kind of at a point in our time where I think we're kind of seeing the replication of what cable was back when HBO started and was using all these things like the PROs negotiated lower fees because it was a new industry and you wanted to support it. But then cable exploded. But then these deals were in place that it took the PROs years and years and lots of legal fees to start pushing up the rates to what they should be based on the success that was achieved by the cable industry so quickly. Um, but, you know, it kind of, it, it, it kind of all depends on like, well, what's the platform and what's happening? MTV, you know, the plus that you have for MTV is that they repeat stuff like crazy. All over so, the you world. Know, we've all had stuff on road, road, road rules back in the day or teen mom or, you know, all these different shows that exist. Yeah. And, the upfront money is crap, but I mean the back end money can can come up to be pretty significant if it just repeats and repeats and repeats, and also gets aired internationally around the world. Um, I mean, I, so in that sense, sky's the limit. But I mean, you know, it, it, I would say certainly, you know, the 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 ones that have made the money that we will never see 
you know, have sort of been like, you know, Michael Scloff and Ali Willis, who wrote the Friends theme, Jonathan Wolf, who wrote Seinfeld, you know, those are kind of, you know, all the cheer, all those themes that we all sort of know, like yeah. those, those people are, I'm not losing any sleep over what their financial situation is because <laughs> they, they made money at the time when the networks were strong and now they're syndicated like crazy. So good for them. But anybody I, I, now, you know, it, it's a it's a tough one now. I, I used to be friendly with Jonathan Wolf before he left L.A. I would interviewed him for uh, an article in a magazine or something and, and loved the guy. He, he's that rare combination of incredible musical talent and a great business head on his shoulders. And he did um, Seinfeld, uh, another one. Um, the lady that had the gay male roommate. I can't. It was a, also a big hit show. Um, oh, Will and Grace. Yeah, Will and Grace. Just those two alone. I mean, you know, they, they both ran for many years. They were syndicated all over the place, um, especially uh, Seinfeld, still in syndication all over the world They're every single day of the year. Anyway, what made him a real genius was that at some point, about 10 or 15 years ago, he packed up his family bought a bunch of acreage on a mountaintop in like North or South Carolina and took his extended family, his parents and his sister or whoever, and built a compound on a mountaintop with like, uh, I heard, you know, like a, a central recreation room and swimming pool for all four or five of the houses on the property. And he just moved up there and living the good life and not paying LA uh, tax or California taxes. So Jonathan Wolf, my hat is off to you, sir. You're a genius. Um, no, he's a, a wonderful, talented guy and s smart guy. And I love that he basically retired so that he could raise his kids. Not everyone can do that, but yep. good for him for doing it. Absolutely. Um, somebody in the chat room said, yeah, you won't make so much from doing the Friends theme today. But that that is an exception. Yes, you will. If you're on one of the major broadcast nets and you write a theme song, that has you know a shelf life of seven or eight or nine or ten years on the broadcast network and then and and around year three or four starts getting syndicated on a global basis and stays syndicated for 20 or 30 years you're going to make a fortune you're going to be a multi 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 millionaire from that one song uh so yeah that that is the brass ring oh of yeah theme i songs. mean bare, bare naked ladies bare naked ladies and big bang theory yeah. Someone else I'm not really losing any sleep over. <laughs> oh, man. You, you alluded to this next question at the beginning of the show. And, and frankly, I don't even know the, the right answer to this, so I'm very curious to hear what you say. But you talked about if you want to get paid, you got to start a publishing company. And immediately in the chat room, people are going... Um, so how do I set up a publishing company? We've only got seven minutes left of today's show. We can pick up on this tomorrow if we need to. Um, and I can't believe you're so gracious to come back again tomorrow. But people always ask me, Michael, do I need to have my own publishing company in order to get paid from my PRO? Or can I just give them, you know, John Doe Music Publishing is the company name. They've got a place to write the checks to. But do I actually need to create a business entity? Well, that so I'm glad you're bringing this up, and I'm hoping you can still hear me okay because my video is a little bit spotty. But um, yeah, we're good. But I, I'm I'm glad you brought this up because I want to make sure we're very clear on what I meant. So um, I am not necessarily saying a business entity in the sense that like you're starting a corporation or an LLC or something like that. What I'm meaning is is you set up a publishing company DBA or name at whichever performing rights society you are a member of. Um, now, in the reason I say that it is admittedly very sync focused and that because that's at Penn Music Group, uh, my company, we're very sync focused. And it, it, any of your listeners out there, you know, who have had music used in film and TV, when when that's done or when each episode or film or whatever is completed a document gets created that's called a music cue sheet and you know the cue sheet lists the name of the song all the songwriters all the publishers 
and the percentages and describe how the music was used. Uh, but what is, is key to point out is that there is one column for writers and one column for publishers. It's a separate column. Now, BMI, I'm only singling them out because, um, uh, though it applies to others, but I have encountered this more with BMI than anywhere else because it is free to join BMI as a writer and then at cost to join as a publisher. And it's I think about 125 bucks as a publisher if you have if you are just uh, you know what they call a sole proprietor your social security number or it's 250 bucks if you're a corporation or an LLC. So when writers reps at BMI are usually tell, get signing folks up because that's their job, they just say you know what you don't need to set up a publishing company we can just pay you your publisher share through your writer account. So a lot of BMI registrations end up showing 200% being paid to the writer mm. because they're, th that's how BMI internally knows we're paying this writer their publisher share. But let's go back to that cue sheet. You get on a TV show, you don't have a publishing company set up, it's only in your individual name. So your name is gonna be listed under the writer column, your name is gonna be listed under the publisher column. But in today's world of digital and databases, all of the societies have a cue sheet database. And, and you know, like all data, everything is always having to be matched up in some way. So a lot of foreign societies will pull in a cue sheet from the database and they are going to try to match up a writer's name with what they find in the database so they know which society to send it to. But they're gonna pull in the publisher which is your individual name, your writer name, they're not going to be able to match it to an existing publisher name. And they don't necessarily know that BMI's deal with you is that they're going to pay your publisher share over through your writer account. So a lot of times writers in that situation, their publisher share will sit in suspense because no society will know who to pay it to and you'll only get your writer share. So that means you're leaving half your money on the table if you got a sync use just because of this logistical, practical piece of paper that has two columns. So I say set up a publishing company and it can still just be under your social security number. You don't need to set up a company company. Um, at ASCAP, it's 50 bucks to join as a writer and 50 bucks to join as a publisher. So even that combined is less th than BMI. I personally feel that the society should get rid of all fees to join or at least have it be consistent. It gets very confusing for new writers to kind of know where they need to be and what they need to pay. Right. Um, but I think it's important to think if, if you are gonna use, if you're gonna get your stuff used in film and TV and you'll show up on a cue sheet, make sure you set up a publishing company name doesn't mean you have to set up a corporation, but just clear it because you'll not leave any money on the table as a result. Great answer and timely. We've got about a minute and a half and I want to give away one of these books because I promised everybody <laughs> I would. I, I'm not exaggerating this just because Michael and I are friends and his co-author Bobby Borg and I have been friends for forever. Um, I will not attach an endorsement to anything that I really truly wouldn't endorse because my reputation would be injured in the process. Not that I've got one, but you know. Uh, anyway, so we're now going to do a drawing for this book, but I would really, really, really appreciate it if people outside of the United States don't put their um, hat in the ring. And the reason is because the last time we tried to ship something from Amazon to somebody in the UK, we had major problems. And I ended up spending far more money than what the, the book cost. Actually, you know what? I remember how we solved the problem. Go ahead, people outside the US, do it. Because here's what I'll do, is I will send you an Amazon gift card digitally that will allow you, allow you to buy it in uh. your country or download the digital version of the book. But I'm heartily endorsing this book. It's extremely well written, unbelievably comprehensive. So to win the book, what you need to do is type in plus one and if i see you typing in plus one more than once i'm coming to your house and i'm gonna hurt you so don't do it 
<laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> yeah, they're they're scared to death of me. Um, anyway, yeah, plus one, just do it. And Liz is going to go up and down the chat room list with her finger, and she's going to pick one, and then she's going to tell us who the winner is. No cheating, or I'll call you out. I'll embarrass you publicly. Or we'll send Bobby Borg over to your house. Bobby can That's be right. scary if he wants to be. That's right. He used to be a drummer. In Still a positive is. way, too. He, exactly. <laughs> he, he was a drummer with warrant. He's been, he's been through hell and back. Liz says, hit the like button while you're at it. Yeah, if you guys enjoyed what you're learning today in this show and find it valuable and entertaining, hit the like button. And if you're not a subscriber to our channel, now you know exactly what you're missing on a regular basis. So hit that red button. And come join us for Quarantine Happy Hour tomorrow. That's right. Four o'clock, same time, same channel. And we're going to... All right. So, Liz, I'm sorry. I was talking and must have missed it. Um, did Juice Davis won? Juice, are you a man or a, a woman? Because I'm really curious because remember Juice Newton? Michael and I are the only two guys here old enough to remember I, Juice I, Newton. I know, I was going to say, <laughs> Ju Juice Newton is our reference. Yeah, I, I don't know. If Ju you know, Juice could be a non-binary name that actually has no gender attached to it. It would be the perfect name for that. <laughs> All right. Truly. Good going. Um, Juice, you won. Um, congratulations. You are going to love this book. Very, yeah, let's have a little applause on that. <laughs> nice. The crowd goes crazy. Um, and you should email Liz, L I Z, at taxi.com and send Liz your um, home address. And we will send out a book. Um, Oh, I was going to say I'll have Michael and Bobby autograph copy, but it's going to be a while before I see them. You know what? I'm going to forge their signatures. <laughs> <So> <laughs> we'll, anyway, we'll figure it out. Here, here comes Liz. She's trying to tell me something. Liz, do you need me? Yes. It wasn't Juice. It's John Hope. She oh. was thanking me for something else. Oh, okay. John, John Hope won. It's not Juice. Okay. John Hope, congratulations. Juice... You're dead to me now. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right, of course. you know, no, you know what? I'll um, tell you what. I'll, you and I will figure out the signatures. But I have a box of books. I will contribute a book so that Juice and John can each get a book. Wow! Awesome. Good job. All right. Well, Liz is probably walking back to her computer. So, Liz, if you're sitting down and hearing this, Michael just generously gave a second book so that Jews can get a copy, too. So if your name starts with J, you get a free book on today's show. Michael, thank you so, <laughs> <laughs> so much for doing this. Um, everybody, I'm plugging the book because it's that good. Seriously, it's like Robin Frederick's book is to songwriting. Whoops. You know what? I'm going to plug this book. Shortcuts to Songwriting. Oh, my God. Look at that. The green screen. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. That's wild. Yeah. Anyway, if write, buy that book if you want to write songs for film and TV because they are different than just writing song songs. Anyway, this book is to publishing what Robin Frederick's books are to songwriting. And, uh, yeah. Anyway, so, Michael, I thank you so much for doing this. Um, I will see you tomorrow. I'll, I'll connect with you at 3.30 so we can get the tech all worked out. We'll go live at 4. We'll be done at 5. And tomorrow on every, tomorrow for the entire hour, I'm going to do nothing but answer questions that you put in the comments under the archive of today's show on YouTube. So if you have questions, and please don't make them oh, like three... Cool. 300 words long, you know, try and keep them pretty succinct. Um, and tomorrow I'm going to print them out. We're going to ask Michael one by one. It's going to be all your questions. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Michael, I love having you on the show. You make my job easy. You make me look good. And that's hard to do, buddy. <laughs> Take care. Uh, well, can't thank you enough for your support of me and Bobby in the book. And I would do this anytime. It's always a blast. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. See you, you tomorrow. Can be my new publicist, too. That's right. All right. Take Bye, care, guys. man. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>